Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? No, sir. I didn't think it polite to listen. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. Speaking of the science of life, have you the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Brackner? Yes, sir. By the way, Ling, I see from your book that last Thursday night, when Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered us have been consumed? Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the highest quality of wine, sir. I often find in married households the champagne is rarely a first-rate brand. Good heavens! It's mad it's so demoralizing as that. I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir, but I have only been married once, and that was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir. I don't think of it much myself. Very natural, I'm sure. That would do, Lane. Thank you. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set as a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, about, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. Ah, uh, Ernest, what brings you to town? Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Eating as usual, I see algae. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth did you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? They are neighbours, neighbours. Good, nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire. Perfectly bored, never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. <laughs> Shropshire is your county, is it not? Shropshire? Yes, yes, of course, sir. Uh, why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who is coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta. Aunt Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful! Yes, yes, that's all very well, but I'm not sure Aunt Augusta will quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. How utterly unromantic you are. I'm not unromantic at all. In fact, why did you come here? I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you said you'd come for pleasure. I call that business. That's so unromantic of you. I'm not unromantic. There's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why, it's very romantic to be in love. But there's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. One may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. But after that, the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If ever I get married, I will certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about the, that, dear Algie. The divorce court was specially invented who, for people whose memories were so curiously constituted. There's no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. <laughs> Don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are made especially for Lady Brown. Well, you have been eating them all the time. That's quite a different matter. She's my aunt. Have some bread and butter. The bread and butter's for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Mm, I'm very good. Bread and butter it is too. You needn't eat it as if you're going to eat it all. You'll act as if you're married to already. And I don't think you ever will be. Then why on earth do you say that? Well, for starters, women never marry the man they flirt with. They don't think it right. No, oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And if you were going to marry her, you would first have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? What on earth do you mean by Cecily? What do you mean, mean Algie, by Cecily? Well, I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. Bring me the cigarette case Mr. Worthing left last time he dined here. Do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? Well, I wish to goodness you would have told me. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. 
I wish you would. I happen to be more than usually hard up. Well, there is no good in offering a large reward now that the thing is found. I think that rather mean of you. Besides, now that I look at the thing, I see it isn't yours at all. Though of course it's mine. You've seen me use it a hundred times. Besides, you've no right whatsoever to read what is inside. It's a perfectly ungentleman ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it's absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should and shouldn't read. More than half of modern culture is based on what one shouldn't read. <laughs> I'm perfectly well aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. It's a gift from someone of the name of Cecily. And you have just said you don't know anyone of the name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes, charming old lady she is too, lives in Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back yes, to me. Yes, but why does she call herself <laughs> Little Cecily if she is your aunt who lives in Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. Surely that is a matter an aunt may decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be just like your aunt. That's absurd. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes, but why does she call you her uncle if she is your aunt who lives at Tunbridge Wells? From little Cecily with her fondest love to dear Uncle Jack. There's no objection I make to an aunt being small, but why an aunt, whatever her size may be, should call her own nephew her, her uncle? It's perfectly absurd. Besides, her name isn't Jack, it's Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's Jack. You have always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to people as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name is Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I've seen in my life. It's ridiculous you're saying your name isn't Ernest. It says so on your cards. Here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, for the album. I'll keep this as proof if ever you decide to tell anyone else your name isn't Ernest. Well, it's Ernest in town and Jack in the country. The cigarette case was given to me in the country. <coughs> yes, but why does your little aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, call you her uncle? Come on, you better have it out at once. My dear Algy, you sound exactly as if you were a dentist. It's very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists do. <laughs> <laughs> now, go on. Why are you Ernest and Tan and Jack in the country? Produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now, produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. <laughs> dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation whatsoever. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me, in his will, guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle from motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives in my house in the country under the charge of her admiral governess, Miss Prism. Where is the place in the country? <laughs> that is nothing to you, dear boy. You won't be invited. I may tell you candidly, though, that the place is not in Shropshire. Oh, I expected that. I've Banbury to cross Shropshire on two occasions. <laughs> now, go on. Why are you Ernest and Town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, I don't know whether you'll be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed in position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It is one's duty to do so, and as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town I have always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets in those dreadful scrapes. That, my dear fellow, is a whole truth pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. That wouldn't at all be a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte. Leave that to the people who haven't been to university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite sure of thinking you're a Bunburyist. What on earth do you mean? See, why you have invented a younger brother, Ernest, so you may travel to town as often as you like. I've created a perfectly invaluable invalid called Bunbury, so I may trot to the country whenever I like. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. For if it wasn't for his bad health, for example, I wouldn't be able to dine with you tonight at Willis's, for I've been engaged to Aunt Augusta for over a week. 
I have invited you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You're terribly careless about sending out invitations. <laughs> Nothing annoys people more than not receiving invitations. You would much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest idea of doing anything of the sort. The starters I dine there on Monday, and once a week is more than enough to dine with one's own relations. Secondly, I know exactly who she was sitting next to. Mary Farquhar who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. It's not right, it's not even decent, it's simply hanging one's clean linen in public. <laughs> Besides, now that I know that you're a Bunburyist, I want to talk to you all about Bunbury. I want to tell you all the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I will kill him in any case. Cecily has grown a little too interested in him. It's rather a bore. So, I'm going to get rid of my brother Ernest, and I strongly advise you do the same with your invalid friend, Mr... With your invalid friend with the absurd name! Nothing would induce me to part with Bunbury! And uh, if you ever get married, which to me seems highly problematic... You'll be delighted to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. Oh, that is nonsense. Say if I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she's the only girl I ever saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly wouldn't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. <laughs> you don't seem to know that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear fellow, is a theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. For heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. It isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relations or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I can get her out of the room for ten minutes so that you may propose to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Willis's? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. So shallow of them. <laughs> Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, dear Eldon. I hope you're behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things really go together. Dear me, you are smart. I am always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. It would leave no room for developments. And I plan to develop in many directions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if we're a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been since her poor husband's death, and i never seen a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea with those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come sit here, Gwendolyn? Oh, thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens, Lane! Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I order them especially. There was no cucumbers in the market, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. I'm greatly distressed to inform you, Aunt Augusta, that there were no cucumbers in the market, not even for ready money. Oh, it really makes no matter, Eldon, when I heard some crumpets with, La with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold with grief. Oh, it certainly has changed its colour. From what cause I, of course, cannot say. I have quite the treat for you tonight, Eldon, and I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She is such a nice woman, so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. I'm afraid, Aunt Augusta, I should have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. Oh, I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs again, fortunately. He's accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and need I say a terrible disappointment. But I've just had a telegram to hear that my poor friend Bunbury is dreadfully ill again. It seems to think I should be with him. It is awfully strange, Algernon. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must <laughs> say, Algernon, I think it is high time Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live 
or to die. This shilly-shallying with the matter is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly something to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. Now, I should be much obliged, Algernon, if you could ask Mr. Bunbury if he could be so kind as to not have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. One wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season when everybody has practically said whatever they had to say, which, in most cases, was not much. I'll speak to Barnbury if he's conscious, but I think I can guarantee he'll be all right by Saturday. The music, on the other hand, is a great difficulty. See, if one plays good music, people won't listen. And if one plays bad music, people won't talk. But I'll run over the programme I've drawn out. If you would kindly follow me into the next room for a moment. Thank you kindly, Algernon. I think that the programme will be delightful after a few expurgations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People seem to think they're improper and look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Oh, certainly, Mama. Charming the day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain they mean something else, and that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And <laughs> I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. Oh, I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I've often had to speak to her about it. Miss Fairfax, I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, I'm quite well aware of the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you've always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I knew I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines, and he's even rich, reached the provincial pulpits, I'm told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. <laughs> From the moment Algernon first mentioned me at a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Oh, passionately. Oh, darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest, do you? But your name is Ernest. Yes, yes, I know it is, but supposing it was something else, do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Ah, oh, well, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation, and like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Well, personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care about the name of Ernest. Well, I don't think it suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say, I think there are other much nicer names. Jack, for instance. A charming name. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Very little music in the name Jack, if any at all indeed. It does not thrill and it produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks and they all, without exception, have been more than usually plain. Oh, besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John. And I pity any woman married to a man called John. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> she would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. No, the only really safe name is Ernest. Oh, hey, Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to waste. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely you know that I love you and you led me to believe that you are not so indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed. Nothing at all has been said about marriage. The subject has not even been touched upon. Well, may I, may I propose to you now? I 
think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I find it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Good. <laughs> yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? But you know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say Gwendolyn, <laughs> will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long you've been about it. I'm afraid you don't have much experience in how to propose. My own one. I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Oh, yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. <laughs> oh, why, Ernest, what wonderfully blue eyes you have. They are quite... What blue? Oh, I hope you will always look at me just like that, especially when there are other people present. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, from the semi recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. <laughs> Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing is not quite finished yet. Finished what? May I ask? I'm engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, but you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged, I or your father will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise. Pleasant or unpleasant, as the case may be, it is hardly a matter she should be allowed to arrange for herself. Now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I'm making these inquiries, you Gwendolyn will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama. The carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, the carriage. <laughs> you may take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer to stand. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I do have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bilton. We work together in fact. I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, I must admit I do smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know. Well, I know nothing, Lady Bracken. I am pleased to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I do not approve of anything that hampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or investments? Investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. Well, I own a house in the country, with land, of course, attached to it. Around 1,500 acres, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people that make anything out of it. <laughs> <laughs> a country house. How many bedrooms? Oh, well, that can be cleared up afterwards. You do have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. She goes about very little. Uh, she is a lady considerably advanced in years. Oh, well, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number, Belgrave Square? 149. Oh, the unfashionable side. I thought there must be something. However, that could be easily altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Well, both if necessary, I presume, Mr. Worthing. What are your politics? I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us, or come in the evening at any rate. Now to minors, uh, minor matters. Are your parents living? 
I have lost both my parents. Both? That seems like carelessness. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your father? Well, I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracken, I said I had lost my parents. Well, it would be nearer to the truth to say my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... Well, I was found. Found? Yes. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, a kind gentleman of a very charitable disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket of Worthing in his time at the pocket. Pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex, a seaside resort. And where did this charitable gentleman with a first-class ticket to Sussex find you? In a handbag. A handbag? <laughs> <laughs> yes, a somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it, an ordinary handbag, in fact. And in which particular locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew find this ordinary handbag? The cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Worthing. I confess. I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born or, at any rate, bred in a handbag. Whether it had handles or not seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life. That reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion and, I believe, has probably been used for that purpose before now. Well, might I ask you what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say that I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. Well, I would strongly advise acquiring some relations and a parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce a handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. But I really think that that should satisfy you, Lady Ratton. Me, Mr. Worthing? What has it got to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I or Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Good morning. <laughs> Sake, don't play that ghastly tune, Algy. How idiotic you are. Didn't it go off all right, old boy? <gasps> you don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you? I know she's a she She's always refusing people. I think it most ill-natured of her. Uh, Gwendolyn is as right as a trivet. As far as she, she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. Never met such a gorgeous. Well, I don't really know what a Gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure that Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster without being a myth. Which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algy. I suppose I shouldn't talk of your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the <laughs> only thing that makes them tolerable. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people that haven't got the smallest knowledge of how to live nor the smallest instinct of when to die. That is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. That is exactly what things were made for. <laughs> Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. <laughs> you don't think that there's any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in, say, 150 years, do you? All women become like their mothers. <laughs> <laughs> That's their tragedy. No man ever does, and that's his. <laughs> is that clever? It's perfectly phrased, and quite as clever as any observation in civilised life should be. I'm sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. It's becoming a public nuisance. 
I wish to heavens we had a few fools left. Oh, we have. <laughs> well, I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools? Why, the clever people, of course. <laughs> what fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about you being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? Oh, my dear fellow, the truth isn't the sort of thing one tells a sweet, refined girl such as Gwendolyn. What extraordinary ideas you have on how to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her, if she's pretty, and to someone else if she's plain. Oh, that is nonsense. <laughs> it isn't. Oh, and what about your brother, the profligate Ernest? Oh, I shall have got rid of him by the end of the week. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die quite suddenly of apoplexy, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary. The sort of thing that runs in families. You'd much better say, ooh, a severe chill. You are quite sure severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of the sort? Of course it isn't. Very well then. Uh, my poor brother Ernest is carried off in Paris quite suddenly of a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you said little Miss Cardew was a little too interested in him. Won't, he feel his, uh, won't she feel his loss a great deal? I'm glad to say that Miss Cardew is not a silly romantic girl. She's a capital appetite, goes long walks, and doesn't pay any attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see this, Cecily. I will take good care you never do. She's excessively pretty and is only just 18. Does Gwendolyn know you have a ward who is excessively pretty and just 18? Uh, one doesn't blurt these things out to people. Uh, Ces Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like, half an hour after they had met, they will be calling each other sister. Women only do that after they've called each other a lot of other things first. <laughs> that is nonsense. It isn't, and if we want to get a good seat at Willis's, we really must go. It's nearly seven. It's always nearly seven. Yes, but I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. What shall we do after dinner? Go to the theatre? No, no, I loathe listening. Well, let us go to a club. No, no, I hate talking. We might trot around to the Empire at ten. Oh, no, I can't bear to look at things. It is so silly. What shall we do? Nothing. It's awful hard work doing nothing. <laughs> Although I don't mind hard work when there's no definite object of any kind. Miss Fairfax. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Now, as you kindly turn your back, I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn, I'm not quite sure I can allow this. At all. <laughs> Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. <laughs> but although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else and marry often, nothing she could possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Oh, Gwendolyn, darling. Oh, the story of your romantic origin, as related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. And your character, your simplicity, makes you incomprehensible to me. Your town address, the Albany I have, what is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. There is a good poster service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will take serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. On my own one. How long do you remain in town? Until Monday. Good. Algy, you can turn around now. Thanks, I've turned around already. <laughs> <laughs> you may also ring the bell. You will let me see you to your carriage, my own darling. Certainly. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. <sighs> A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bunburying. Yes, sir. I probably shan't be back till Monday, so you can pack all my smoking jackets and, of course, the bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, <laughs> you're a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. <laughs> oh, 
there's a sensible intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. What on earth are you so amused at? Oh, I'm a little worried about poor Bunbury, that's all. If you're not careful, that Bunbury of yours will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They're the only things that are never serious. That is nonsense. You never talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. as the pruning of flowers. It's rather Martin's duty than yours. Especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well I look quite plain after I have my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German, as he's leaving the town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he's leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he's so serious, I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to, com to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a high sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I'm surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. He must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. Oh, I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometime. We might have a good influence over him in this prison. I'm sure you certainly would. You know, German and geology and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I'm not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favour of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a minute's notice. <laughs> As a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary whole. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Marty sends us. Do not speak slightingly of three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? Oh, how wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I hate novels that end happily. They depress me so much. <laughs> <laughs> the good ended happily, and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so. But it seems very unfair. When was your novel ever published? <sighs> Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost in a slave. To your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Shalcible coming up through the garden. Dr. Shalcible, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning, Miss Prism? You are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache, Doctor. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park. Cecily, I've not mentioned anything about a headache. But no, dear Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope Cecily will not be inattentive. 
Though I'm afraid I have. That was strange. <laughs> Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prison Pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from from the bees. <laughs> Ahem, Mr. Worthing, I suppose, is not returned from town yet. We do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes, he usually likes to spend his Sundays in London. He is not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment. As by all accounts, that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mustn't disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical illusion, merely. Drawn from pagan authors. <laughs> I shall see you both without an evening song. I think, dear doctor, I will have a stroke with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as to schools and back. That would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may have met. This is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Horrid political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid journal. A Mr. Ernest Worthing has driven here from the station. And he has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4 the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak with you privately for a moment. Um, ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. And you can talk to the housekeeper about your room with him. Yes, Miss. I have never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm so afraid he will look just like everyone else. He <laughs> does. <laughs> You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You must be under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily. You, I can see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother. My cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Wicked? <laughs> I'm not wicked, Cecily. You mustn't think I'm wicked. If you are not, then you've certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you've not been leading a double life pretending to be wicked and then really being good all the time, that would be hypocrisy. Oh, why well, I have been rather reckless. <laughs> I am glad to hear it. In fact, now you mention it, I've been particularly bad in my own little way. I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It's much pleasanter here with you. I can't understand who we're here at all. Uncle Jack will be back until Monday afternoon. What a terrible disappointment I've got to leave first thing Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I'm anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, the appointment's in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if anyone wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you should wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he is anxious to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. He's gone up to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy me out, but he's no taste in neckties at all. <laughs> I don't think it's require a necktie. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Well, the accounts I've received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? Oh, I'm afraid I am not. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make it your mission. I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. <laughs> Would you mind my reforming myself instead? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. <laughs> you are looking a little worse. That is because I'm hungry. Oh, you have this of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Would you come in? Thank you. Might have a buttonhole first. I never remember any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. Am I rose here now? No, I'd sooner a rose. Why? Because you were like a rose, Cousin Cecily. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is right for you to 
speak to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You were the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says all good looks are a snare. They're a snare every sensible man should love to be caught in. I don't think I should care to catch a sensible man. I wouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> you are too much alone, do Dr. Shazbul. You should get married. Miss Anthrope, I can understand. A woman thrope, never. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church is distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realise, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads to weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally attractive when married? No man, man is ever attractive, except to his wife. And often I have been told not even to her. <laughs> that depends on intellectual sympathies of a woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Rightness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. But where is Cecily? Perhaps she followed us to the school. Mr. Worthing. Mr. Worthing. This is indeed a surprise. We do not expect you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than I expected. Dr. Chasuble, I hope you are well. I trust this garb of woe does not be taken some terrible country. My brother. More shameful deaths and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead. What a lesson for him. I trust you'll profit by it. Dear Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolences. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you are always the most generous and forgiving of her. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very, very sad indeed. <laughs> Were you with him at the end? No, he died abroad, in Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> As a man sows, so shall you reap. Charity, dear Mr. Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I, myself, am peculiarly susceptible to drop. <laughs> Will the interment take place here? He has ex seemed to express a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? I fear that hardly points to any serious state of the mind of the lost. You would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this. Tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manor can be adapted to almost any occasion, joyful or, as in the present case, distressing. I have preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation, and festal days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral as a charity sermon on behalf of the Society for Prevention of Discontent, among other orders. The bishop, who was present, was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. Uh, you mentioned christenings, I think, dear doctor. But I suppose you know how to christen, all right? I mean, you are continually a christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poorer classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. What is there any infant in your interest, in Mr. Worthing? Your brother was unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. But it is not for any child, dear doctor. I am very fond of children. No. The fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you've been christened before. 
But I don't remember anything about it. What, have you any grave doubts on the subject? I intend to have. Of course, I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way. Not or at if you all. think I'm a little too Not old. at all. The sprinkling <laughs> and the immersion of adults is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehensions. Sprinkling is all that is necessary. <laughs> or I think advisable. Our weather is so changing. At what hour would you wish this only for? Oh, I might trot round about five o'clock this afternoon. Admirably, admirably. In fact, I've seen her so many to form a time. A case of twins that occurred recently on one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Jenkins, the carter. A most hard-working man. Oh, I don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. It would be childish. Would half past five do? Perfectly, perfectly. And now, I mustn't intrude into a house of sorrow any longer. <laughs> I merely beg you not to be bowed down by grief. What sometimes are bitter trials, are often blessings in disguise. <laughs> this seems to me to be blessing of an extremely obvious kind. Uncle Jack, I am pleased to see you back. But what horrid clothes you've got on, do you have any change? Cecily! My child, my child. Well, what is the matter? I you <laughs> do look happy. You look as if you were too thick. And I've got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? Your brother Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense. I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that, Uncle Jack. No matter how badly he behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I will tell him to come out, and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. <laughs> I think we've all been resigned to his loss. His sad return seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother Ernest in the dining room. I don't know what it all means. I think it perfectly absurd. Oh, good. Brother John! <laughs> I have come all the way from town to tell you I'm terribly sorry for all the wrongs I've caused you in the past, and I intend to leave a better life in the future. Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think his coming here disgraceful, and he knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everybody. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury. I <laughs> <laughs> surely there must be much good in one so kind of an invalid, and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Oh, he's been telling you about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. <sighs> Bunbury? Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury, or anything else for that matter. It is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course I admit the faults were all on my side, but I must say, I think Brother John's coldness to me is particularly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially as it's the first time I've come. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Jack, if you do not shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, <laughs> this is the last time I shall do it. It is pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? <laughs> I think we might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you come with us? Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. <laughs> we must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. <laughs> Out, you young scoundrel! You've got to leave this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bummering here. <laughs> I put Mr. Ernest things in the room next to your own, sir, and I suppose it's alright. What? His luggage. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three for Mantius, two hat boxes, and dressing case. I'm afraid I shan't be able to stay for more than a week this time. A merryman ordered the dog cart. It seems Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful lie you are, Jack. I've been called up to town by anyone. Yes, you have. 
I don't hear any Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk with Miss Cardwell like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. It's perfectly <laughs> ridiculous to dress in mourning for someone who's staying in your house as a guest for a week. You are certainly not going to be staying with me for a week. As a guest or anything else, you've got to leave by the 4-5 train. I couldn't possibly leave you when you're in mourning. You would have been most unkind of you would leave me if I were in mourning, would you? Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, but do be quick about it. I've never seen someone take so long to dress and with such little regard. <laughs> well, at any rate, it is better than being as overdressed as you always are. If ever I'm overdressed, I always make up for it by being immensely overeducated. <laughs> your vanity is ridiculous, your conduct an outrage, and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, You've got to leave by the 4-5, and I hope you will have a pleasant journey back to London. This bumbering, as you call it, has not been a great success. I think it's been a great success. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in love with Cecily, and that is all. But I must arrange to meet her on another bumbering before I leave. Ah, here she is. Oh, I nearly came back to water the horses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's going to fetch the dog cart for me. Is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's sending me away. Then have we got to part? It's a very painful parting. It is always painful parting from people whom one has known for such a comparatively brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, but even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The dog horse waiting, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. I hope you won't mind, Cecily, if I say quite frankly and openly that you are in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. <laughs> I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. Mm -hmm. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Your diary? I'd give anything to have a look. May I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy, Ernest. But pray, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You may go on, I'm quite ready to know. <coughs> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. <laughs> ever since I looked upon your incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, hopelessly, devotedly. <laughs> I don't think you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, hopelessly, devotedly. Hopelessly doesn't make much sense, does it? Darling. <laughs> the dark horse is waiting, sir. Tell him to come around next week at the same hour. <laughs> yes, sir. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. I don't care for Jack. I don't care for anyone in the world but you, Cecily. I love you. You will marry me, won't you? <laughs> you silly boy. We've been engaged for the last three months. <laughs> <laughs> engaged for the last three months? Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, became the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, well, any man who is often talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, Ernest, but I fell in love with you. Darling. But when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or another, and after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. And the next day I bought this ring in your name, and this is the bangle that the true lover's not I promised you always to wear. Did I get you this? It's fairly pretty, isn't it? <laughs> it's got wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given you for living such a bad life. 
Oh, and this is the box where I keep all your dear letters. My letters? But I haven't sent you any letters. <laughs> you need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember all too well I was forced to write all your letters for you. <laughs> Three times a week and sometimes off enough. Surely I may have a look at them. Oh no, they would make you fart if conceited. The three you wrote to me after our engagement had been broken off are so beautiful and so badly spelt. I can hardly read them now without crying a little. But was our engagement broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you like. <clears throat> Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. But why have you broken it off? I'm rather hurt to hear you broken it off. I had done nothing wrong. I'm rather hurt, particularly when the weather was so charming, that you would break it off. Well, it would hardly have been a very serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. Darling. You dear romantic boy. What a perfect angel you are. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Oh yes, of course, with a little help from others. <laughs> you won't ever break off our engagement again, will you? I do think I could now that I've actually met you. Besides, of course, there is the question of your name. Yes, of course. You mustn't laugh at me, darling, but it has always been a girlish dream of mine to marry someone by the name of Ernest. <laughs> there is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. Do you mean to say you couldn't love me if I had a different name? But what name? Oh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance? No. I don't like the name of Algernon. But why, pretty Cecily, should you object to the beautiful name of Algernon? It's rather an aristocratic name, I think. Do you mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Algernon? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character, but I fear that I shall not be able to give you my undivided attention. Your rector I assume is experienced in all the ceremonies of the church. Oh yes, Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on a most important christening. I mean a most important meeting. I shan't be more than half an hour. Considering that We've been engaged since the 14th of February last, and I only met you today for the first time. It seems rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. <laughs> Can't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. Oh, what an impetuous boy he is, and I like his hair so much. I will enter his proposal into my diary. Hey, Miss Fairfax is called to see Mr. Ernest Wording. Very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Wilding in his library? Mr. Ernst won direction from the director some time ago, Miss. Pray ask the lady to come here. Mr. Wilding is sure to be back soon. Oh, and you can bring tea. Oh, uh, yes, Miss. Miss Fairfax, I suppose one of the many good elderly women associated with Uncle Jack and some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't like women who are interested in philanthropic work. I think it's so forward of them. Hey, Miss Fairfax. Pray let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Ahem. <laughs> <laughs> Cecily Cardew, what a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we've known each other for such a comparatively brief space of time. Won't you sit down? I may call you Cecily, may I not? If you wish. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? Yes. Well, then that is all quite settled then, is it not? I hope so. Perhaps this is a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You have never heard of Papa, I suppose? I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I am glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The home seems to me to be the proper sphere for the man. Oh, and certainly once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. 
It makes men very attractive. Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of her system. So, do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I am very fond of being looked at. <laughs> you were here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no. I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advantages resides here also? No, no. I have no mother. Nor, in fact, any relations. Really? My guardian, with the assists of Miss Prism, have the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh. Strange you never mentioned to me here at ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I cannot say, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I am very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know you are Mr. Worthing Ward, I cannot help expressing a wish you were a little older than you seem to be and not quite so alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly... Uh, pray do. I feel that when one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, <laughs> to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish you were fully 42 and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honour. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. His brother? Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say that they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, oh, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I have never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful. <laughs> oh, Cecily, <laughs> you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible had any cloud come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Dear Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. A little county newspaper sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. Cecily, I'm afraid there is some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post Saturday, the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some strange mistake. Uh, Mr. Ernest Worthing proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at exactly 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One must always have something sensational to read on the train. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you, but I'm afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish, but I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he has clearly... <clears throat> Changed his mind. <laughs> if the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once, and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have gotten into, I will never approach him for it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. 
Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say that I have never seen a spade. <laughs> it is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. Shall I go to tea as usual, Miss? Yes, as usual. <laughs> Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one may see five counties. Five counties? I don't <laughs> think I should like that. I hate clouds. <laughs> I suppose that is why you live in a town. <laughs> Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Uh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. <laughs> Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country if anybody who is anybody does. The country always seems to bore me to death. Uh, this is what the newspapers are calling the agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I've been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Detestable girl. <laughs> but I require tea. Sugar? Oh no, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. <laughs> Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen in the best houses nowadays. Hand that to Miss Fairfax. from the machinations of any other girl. There are no lengths to which I will not go. From the moment I saw you, I knew I distrusted you. I felt you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such manners. My first impressions of people are invariably right. <laughs> it seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighbourhood. <laughs> <laughs> Ernest, my own. Ernest. A moment. May I ask if you're engaged to be married to this young lady? Dear little Cecily, of course not. What could have put such an idea in your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I knew there must be some slight error, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present around your waist is Mr. John Worthing. <laughs> I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. Jack. Oh. Here is Ernest. Cecily. I don't mean to Ernest. <laughs> Are you engaged to be married to that young lady? To what young lady? <laughs> <laughs> Good heavens, Gwendolyn! Yes, to Gwendolyn, I'm Gwendolyn. Of course not. What could have put such an idea in your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I felt there was some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman that is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh. Are you called Algernon? 
I cannot deny it. Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. But my name certainly is John. It has been John for years. It seems to me that a gross deception has been practiced on both of us. My poor wounded Cecily, my sweet old Gwendolyn. <laughs> You will call me sister, will you not? <laughs> there is just one question I would like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea. Mr. Worthing, there is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it pains me very much to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life I have ever been reduced to such a painful position. And I'm rather quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, to speak quite frankly, I have no brother Ernest. I have no brother at all. I've never had a brother and I certainly don't intend on having any brother of any kind. No brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Not even of any kind. I think it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us are engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No. Men are so cowardly, aren't they? <laughs> This ghastly state of things is what you call bumbering, I suppose. Oh, yes, and a perfectly wonderful bumbering it is, too. <laughs> One of the best I've ever had. Well, you've no right whatsoever to bumbery here. That's absurd. One can bumbery wherever one chooses. Every serious bumbery knows that. Serious bumbery? Good head. Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any enjoyment in life. <laughs> I happen to be serious about Bunbury. What on earth you're serious about, I haven't the remotest idea. Everything I should fancy you is such a trivial nature. The only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. You won't be able to run down to the country quite so often as you used to do, dear Algy, and a very good thing too. Well, your brother Ernest is a little off-colour, isn't he? <laughs> You won't be able to trot to the town as often as you like, and not a bad thing either. <laughs> as for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I must say that your taking in a sweet, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable. To say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I see no defence in your deceiving a brilliant, experienced lady such as Miss Fairfax. To say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. But I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn. That is all. I love her. I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. That is all. I adore her. There is certainly no chance in your marrying Miss Cardew. I don't see much likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss um, Fairfax being united. <laughs> <laughs> that is none of your business. If it was my business, I certainly wouldn't talk about it. It's vulgar to talk about one's own business. You'll only do that at dinner parties. How can you sit there, calmly eating muffins, when we are in this horrible trouble? I can't quite make it out. You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The crumbs will get everywhere. One should always eat muffins quite calmly. It is the only way to do so. <laughs> well, I say it's perfectly heartless you're eating muffins at all. Under the circumstances. When I am in distress, eating is the only thing that consoles me. In fact, when I'm in great distress, I refuse everything but food and drink. At the present moment, I'm unhappy, so I'm eating muffins. Besides, I'm particularly fond of muffins. <laughs> well, that is no reason why you should eat them all in that greedy way. I wish you would have a tea cake instead. I don't like tea cake. Argy, I don't want you here. Why don't you go? 
I couldn't possibly go without having my dinner first. Nobody goes without having their dinner except a vegetarian and people like that. Besides, I just made an arrangement with Dr. Shazbo to be christened at a quarter to six under the name Ernest. <laughs> my dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements with Dr. Chasuble to be christened myself this afternoon at 5.30, and I naturally will take the name Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't both be christened Ernest. It's absurd. Besides, I have a perfect right to be christened if I like. There is no evidence at all to suggest I was ever christened by anybody. It's entirely different in your case. You have been christened already. Yes, but I have been christened for years. Yes, but... <laughs> But you have been christened. That is the important thing. Exactly. <laughs> so I know my constitution can stand it. If you aren't quite sure if you ever have been christened, I must say I think it rather dangerous. You're venturing on it now. You can't have forgotten someone very close to you was carried off by a severe chill in Paris. <laughs> but you said it yourself, a severe chill was not hereditary. Oh, it used to be. But I dare say it is now. Science is always making wonderful improvements in things. <laughs> that is nonsense. You're always talking nonsense. Jack, you were at the muffins again. I told you I was particularly <laughs> fond of them. Algy, I don't want you here. Why don't you just go? I haven't finished my tea yet. Besides, there's some muffins left. <laughs> <laughs> I have the greatest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German scepticism. <laughs> that explanation seemed quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. It seems to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Miss Moncrief has said. His voice alone seems to inspire one with absolute credulity. <laughs> 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 so you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. <gasps> True! I had forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them the task is not a pleasant one? Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I always speak at the same time as other people. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you take the time from me? Certainly. <laughs> Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. 
Our Christian, Christian name is not at all, but we are, are going to be christened this afternoon. For me, you are prepared to do this terrible thing. I am. To please me, you are ready to face this fearful ordeal. I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. No. We are. They have moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. Darling. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Bracken. No good news. Gwendolyn, <laughs> what does this mean? Merely that I'm engaged to be married to Mr. Werbeck. Come here, sit down, sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, physical weakness in the old. Apply, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusting maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin. I followed her at once by a luggage train. Of course, you must clearly understand that any and all communication between you and my daughter must cease immediately. I'm engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracken. Oh, you are nothing of the kind, sir. Now, as regards Algernon. Algernon. Yes, Aunt Augusta? May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Bunbury? No, uh, Bunbury doesn't live here. Bunbury's somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury's dead. Dead? <laughs> <laughs> when did he die? Must have been awfully sudden. Oh, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. Bunbury died this afternoon. <laughs> and what did he die of? Bunbury? What did Bunbury die of? What did Bunbury die of? Um... Bunbury was quite exploded. <laughs> exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished with morbidity. No, I mean to say Bunbury was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury couldn't live, so Bunbury died. <laughs> <laughs> However, I am glad that he made some definite decision for some definite course of action at last. Now, Mr. Worthing, may I ask whose hand it is that my nephew is currently holding in what seems to be a particularly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily. I beg your pardon? Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. Well, I don't know if there is anything peculiarly exciting in this particular part of Harpeture. The amount of engagements that go on seem to me to be considerably above the average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. Mr. Worthing, I feel it will not be out of place on my part to make some preliminary inquiries. May I ask if Miss Cardew is at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? <laughs> <laughs> I merely desire information. Until yesterday I was not aware that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, South West. Dorking, Surrey, and uh, the Spurn, Fifeshire, NB. That sounds not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof do I have of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They are open to your inspection, Lady Rapnell. I have known strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Mark B, Mark B, and Mark B. Hmm. Mark B, Mark B, and Mark B. <laughs> <laughs> A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am also told that one of the Mr. Mark B's is occasionally seen at dinner parties. So far, I'm satisfied. 
How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I may tell you, I have also in my possession, you will be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, a baptism, whooping cough registration, vaccination confirmation, and the measles, both the German and English variety. Ah, a life crowded with incident, <laughs> although perhaps somewhat too exciting for such a young girl. I do not approve of premature experiences. Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. There is not a moment to lose. I guess I had better ask Mr. Worthing, as a matter of form, if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, around £130,000 in the funds. That is all goodbye, Lady Bracken. I'm so pleased to have seen you. A moment, Mr. Worthing. <laughs> £130,000. And in the funds. Miss Cardew seems a quite attractive young lady now that I look at her. <laughs> Very few women have any really solid qualities nowadays, any of the ones that stay and improve with time. Cecily, dear, won't you come here? Mm, pretty girl, your dress is sadly simple, and your hair looks as if nature might have left it all together. But that could be easily fixed. A thoroughly experienced French maid can produce really marvellous results in a very brief space of time. In fact, I remember recommending one to my dear friend, Lady Lansing. And after three months, her own husband didn't know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. <laughs> Wouldn't you kindly turn around to me, child? No, no, no. The side views are what I want. Ah, um, yes. Your side profile has very distinct social possibilities. Two weak points in our age are our want of principle and our want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. This <laughs> diet depends largely on how the chin is worn. It is worn very high at present. Algernon. Algernon. Yes, Auntie Gaster? <laughs> there are distinct social possibilities in this Cardinal's profile. Cecily is the prettiest girl I ever saw. I don't care toppings about social possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> Algernon, never speak disrespectfully of society. Only people who can't get into it do that. Miss <laughs> 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 Cardew, of course you must know that my nephew has absolutely nothing but his debts to depend upon. However, I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Brecknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed of letting that stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. Cecily, you may kiss me. <laughs> Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. I think the wedding had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. I do not approve of long engagements. It gives people the opportunity of getting to know one another before marriage, which I think <laughs> is never advisable. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Certainly, dear. What is your age? Well, I am really only 18, but I admit to 20 at evening parties. Oh, you are quite right in making some slight alteration. A woman should never be quite accurate about her age. It is so calculating. <laughs> Eighteen, but admitting to twenty evening parties. Well, it is not very long until you will come of age, so I believe that your guardian's consent is a matter of no importance whatsoever. Pray excuse me for interrupting you again, Lady Bracknell, but it is only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age until she is thirty-five. 
I do not think that that is a really grave objection, Mr. Worthing. 35 is a very attractive age. In fact, lots of women in London stay 35 for years, all of their own accord. <laughs> My dear friend, the Duchess of Bilton, has stayed 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40. <laughs> and that was quite some time ago now. <laughs> so I do not see any reason why Miss Cardinal, second, dear, should not be just as attractive, if not even more attractive, than she is now when she turns 35. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algy, could you wait for me till I was 35? <laughs> you know I could, of course. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. <laughs> I don't wait for five minutes for anything. I myself am not punctual, but I like punctuality in others. And while well, waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrief. My dear <laughs> Mr. Worthing, as Cecily states, quite frankly, that she cannot wait until she is 35, a statement which shows quite an impatient future, might I add. I beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracken, <laughs> the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. Mr. Worthing, you are quite aware that that is completely out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. <laughs> that is not the destiny that I desire for my dear Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Gwendolyn, we must leave at once. We've already missed five, if not six trains. Any more might expose us to comment on the platform. <laughs> Everything is quite ready for the Christians. The christening, sir, is not that somewhat premature? <laughs> Both these men have a desire for immediate battle. At their age, the idea is gross and irreligious. Eldonor, I forbid you to get baptized. If Lord Bracknell knew that this was the way in which you wasted your time and money, he would be thoroughly disappointed. Am I to be informed that there are to be no christenings this afternoon at all? I don't think, as things are now, it would be much of practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you. <laughs> <laughs> they savour of the heretical views of Anabaptists, views in which I have refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. But as your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that Miss Prism has been waiting for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell, I am on my way to join her. Pray, let me detain you for a moment. This matter may be one of great importance to myself and Lord Breton. Is this Miss Prism a lady of repellent aspect remotely connected with education? She is the very picture of respectability. And what position does she hold in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. Oh, it is obviously the same person. Despite what I hear of her, I must speak to her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. <laughs> <laughs> I was told you'd step in the vestry, dear Canon. I've been waiting there for you for an hour and fifty minutes. Prism. Miss Prism. Prism, where is that baby? Twenty-eight years ago, you left mine and Lord Bracknell's residence, number 104 Upper Grosvenor Street, and you never returned. You were in charge of a perambulator containing a baby of the male sex. After weeks of elaborate investigation by the Metropolitan Police, we found the perambulator. It was standing idle in a 
lonely corner of Bayswater, but the baby was nowhere to be found. Prison, where is that baby? Lady Brockville, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever brought into my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old, capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction, for which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. But where did you deposit of the handbag? Uh, do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. Uh, I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger <coughs> railway stations in London. Which railway station? Uh, Victoria, the Brighton Line. I must retire to my room for a minute. Gwen, wait here. If you are not too long, I will wait for you all my life. <laughs> What do you think this means, Lady Buckner? <laughs> oh, I daren't assume, Dr. Chasuble. You must be aware that coincidences of this nature are hardly considered the thing in families of such high position in society as ours. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. <laughs> <laughs> Your guardian is a very emotional nature. <laughs> oh, I do wish you would arrive at some conclusion. This suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Prism, is this the handbag? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It seems you lie. Yes. Here is the injury received through the upsetting of the Cower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. And here, on the mining, is a stain caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred in Leamington. And here, on the lock, are my initials. I had forgotten that in an extravagant mood I had placed them there. The bag's undoubtedly mine. I am delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes, mother. Mr. Burley, <laughs> I am unmarried. Unmarried? I do not deny that that is a serious blow. But who can cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why must there be one law for men and another for women? Mother. I forgive you. Oh, Mr. Worthing, there is some error. There is a lady who can tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you mind informing me who I am? <laughs> well, I'm afraid the answer I'm about to give you is not going to altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister. Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. <laughs> <laughs> Algie's elder brother. Then I have a brother after all. I always knew I had a brother. I always said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have ever doubted that I had a brother? <laughs> Miss Prism, my unfortunate younger brother. Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate younger brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate younger brother. Uh, Algy, you young scoundrel. You've never treated me like a brother in all your life. You'll have to treat me with more respect in the future. 
I suppose, but I was out of practice. <laughs> My own one, but what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you've become someone else? Good heavens, I'd quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. Oh, I never change, except in my affections. What a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. <laughs> then the point must be cleared up at once. A moment, Lady Bracknell. At the time Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Oh, well, of course. Your doting parents had left it upon you every luxury that money could buy. Then I had been christened. That is settled. Now, what Christian name was I given? Let me know the worst. Well, being the elder son, naturally you were christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? I cannot presently recall. <laughs> Although I do not doubt that he did have one. <laughs> Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? We weren't exactly on speaking terms. He died before I was one. <laughs> His name would appear in the army list of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. Well, he was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. But I do not doubt that his name would appear in any military directory. The army lists of the last 40 years are here. These delightful records should have been my constant study. M, generals. Malum, Maxbum, Magni. Ghastly names they have. Mark B. Miggs B. Mobs, Moncrief, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel General, Captain, General, 1840, 1860, 1869, Ernest, John. I always told you that my name was Ernest, didn't I, Gordon? Well, it is Ernest after all. I mean, it's naturally Ernest. My own Ernest. I thought from the first you could have no other name. Gwendolyn. It is a terrible thing for a man to find out quite suddenly that all his life he's been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you feel it? I can, for I feel you are sure to change. Oh Letitia. Frederick, at last. Cecily, at last. Gwen, at last. My nephew. You seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta. I think I've realized, for the first time in my life, the vital importance of being earnest. <laughs>